I don't know if it's gone down. Yeah. Okay. We are live. Hello, everyone. Hey, audience there. Um, welcome. So let me zoom out. Can everyone see my screen? Do you want to double check? So um, all speakers, mic ready. So audience in front of the screen right now. So if you are having problem seeing us in the live streaming video, please refresh your page. Sometimes Crowdcast do has the kind of issue, but usually in most cases it works fine. And uh, um, if you will have time, we also create a little poll in the bottom. You can vote for the best time moving forward as we do um, receive a message from some audience that it's perfect event, just like time probably doesn't work out. So definitely would love, love to know what's the best time moving forward to organizing future events. Um, so definitely um, spend some time and the uh, vote for your favorite time. So once we get ready, let's get started. First of all, um, welcome to LOE Log Connecting, pivoting and the fundraising in the post-COVID era. My name is Dre. I'm, my, I'm currently leading the operations and the partnership at Larry's Labs. So we are launching LOE Log Connecting series as a community through events, focusing on providing constructive value and the knowledge to young professionals and startup fans interested in venture capital, tech fields, and the founders seeking resources and abilities. As moving forward to the next chapter, I would like to invite Michelle, currently the partner and the co-founder of Larry's Labs, to share us more about uh, Larry's Labs, what we do, who we are, and uh, the mission we are driving forward. Hey, Michelle, are you there? Yeah. Hi, Jia. Thanks for the intro. Hi, everyone. Thank you again for joining us tonight. To those who have participated in our previous events, thank you for your support. To those who might join us tonight for the first time, we welcome you. Lars Labs is an investment-driven startup accelerator based in New York City. We help founders with a global vision to expand in US and Asia. Every year, we invest and accelerate eight to 10 startups through our 10-week program. In the past few, day, a few years, we have helped 20 startups across six batches with two successful exits. We also honored to be selected as one of the top 100 startup accelerators worldwide by Crunchbase in 2019. Earlier this year, when COVID-19 started, we pivoted our Batch 6 program from on-site to an online virtual program with support and trust from our mentors and founders from different regions. In May and June, we organized the Supernova 2020 Global Pitch Competition to help founders access a broader range of resources worldwide in surreal times. And among the application pool of hundreds of startups, two teams got selected into the semifinal round and they will be invited to a trip to China competing for the final cash prize near the end of the year. Two teams also got selected to join our Batch 7 Accelerator program. Building a global community is part of our mission so we came up with LEL Connecting, which is a series of events focused on connecting new era post COVID-19 and connecting diversity to support founders and startup professionals globally. In connecting the new era sessions, top industry professionals from startup and VC world will share firsthand insights and expertise with founders, startup fans, and investors looking to pay with COVID-19. And in the connecting diversity sessions, founders and investors, as well as tech executives and entrepreneurs from a diverse background will come together and address certain topics, aim at the current political landscape and share personal experience. So I hope you will enjoy these events. Now, let me give the stage back to Jie. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Well, welcome back, everyone. So um, as Michelle mentioned, LA Connecting, we're going to focus in two directions, Connecting New Era, um, which more focus on topics about po um, post-COVID-19 and uh, how we're going to move forward, what kind of pivoting cases and the learnings from the founders and investors, and also connecting diversity that we concentrate more topics going forward about um, minority founders, founders from international and more diverse background. So um, here's a quick like, calendar moving forward for the rest of you. Um, do remember to follow us if you want to stay updated um, from the future events through social media and the newsletter. And uh, yeah, so as next, I would like to introduce the speakers tonight. So one of our main speaker, not unfortunately due to his um, personal emergency and uh, won't be able to join us tonight. So I wish him the best. And But we are going to have great speakers tonight. Um, first, let me introduce Li Ling. 
Lee is a co-founder of RenHub and the RealtyHub.com. RenHub is a YC um, graduate from 2009 summer program and appeared in the Harvard Business School case study, titled as a killing prejudice. Lee is also an angel investor who focuses on pre-series A and the pre-C investment. He graduated from MIT. So before he, his entrepreneur journey, Lee worked at the top quantitative hedge fund, such as the Shaw to Schema Investment, as well as Microsoft. Um, last, Lee is also a co-founder at Lee's Labs, who shared his experience from Y Combinator and then turned that into the foundation of our service program today. So thank you, Lee, and great to have you here. Next, also want to introduce Melody Cole. Melody is currently a partner at NextView Ventures, based in its New York City office. So prior to joining to NextView, Melody was head of product at Blue Apron, which is, for most of you know, a public trading company right now. And she started as the first product hire when the company was 18 months old with only 20 employees in headquarters. Melody helped scale the business through hyper growth about 25 times in 3.5 years and its IPO later on, building and leading a 35-person team across product management, product design, and their data science. Melody holds an MBA with distinction from the Harvard Business School and the BS in the commerce with distinction from the University of Virginia. So welcome both of you, Lee and Melody. It's great to have you guys both here tonight and definitely looking forward to um, having a productive conversation tonight. So moving forward, let me give the spotlight to both of the speaker. Hi, Lee, are you there? Hi, Melody. Hello. Welcome to join. Yes. So yeah, so tonight our topic, um, kicking off, we're gonna talk about pivoting and the fundraising in the post-COVID, but we we'll definitely get great ideas, you know, learning from you guys. There's some interesting observations about how startup pivoting, some case studies, you either hear from your friends, your personal investment portfolios, or in your personal network. Um, what are some interesting cases that pivot successfully in the past few months based on your learning and observations? Um, I'm a VC, so I can go first. Sure. Uh, sure. So next few, we are C stage focused uh, VC firm. So we only do seed and pre-seed investing. Uh, we're not uh, what some other call life cycle firm that does C series A, B, so C is kind of our areas. Uh, so a lot of my comments today are going to be focused on kind of that stage. I would say that uh, March and April, everything was frozen. Uh, the, the sky was falling. The market was going, you know, seems to be dropping 10% a day. And th there was a kind of an immediate freeze of activity. Um, what I would say now, though, is, is right now, um, you know, I would say the past eight weeks are pretty busy. Uh, activities have come back. Um, probably like starting late May, June, July, because what happened is, you know, when March and April hit COVID, and this is, again, this is a U.S. centric view. We only invest in U.S. Um, everyone, including us, went back to triage portfolio companies, spend time with founders, rework their burn and projections. And we basically tell everybody, if you don't have to raise in 2020, do not go out and raise money in 2020. Uh, you do not want to be talking to VCs right now. Uh, we even have late stage companies that, you know, this is like a round or prior, you know, a round or two before the IPO round that had a late stage investor term sheet that got pulled. Um, the term sheet was signed a couple of weeks before COVID, uh, you know, mid-March market collapsed and the investor just decided to renege on term sheet. Uh, so that ended up being an insider round. So things like that were happening. Uh, so there's a triage period and every company went through the period of um, kind of recalibration of their burn and business plan. And, you know, I would say I'll, I'll put companies in three buckets. One is, which is probably the minority in everybody's portfolio, which is you're in business is in a category that's directly impacted by COVID in a negative way. Travel, hospitality, food, uh, and, and that, that's very unfortunate. And a lot of those businesses, like if you have enough runway, you can potentially try to survive till 2021. But a lot of those, um, some of those companies were not in that position. The second bucket, which is probably the majority, which is um, with the slowdown business activities, you have um, a little bit of slowdown as a result, but you're not, your business model is not directly negatively impacted. So an average SaaS business is in that category. And the third bucket is you actually have some tailwind because of COVID. So digital health, education, 
e-commerce actually. Um, and these companies are actually growing faster, though some of them have operational challenges because they don't have the bandwidth to manage that. So, you know, I would say fast forward, um, right now uh, at the C stage market, um, people are out in the woodwork again, talking to investors. And, you know, back in April, you know, the, the, the VC, my peer set were thinking like, oh, there might be a COVID discount from a valuation point of view because the market was suppressed. I, I would say that's not the mentality right now. Um, there is such thing as fly to quality, uh, both as seed and series A, meaning companies that seem to have really quality founding team and have really quality traction and business model. Those are actually getting even more interest because in this day and age, when people can't meet in person, um, investors want to focus on that kind of opportunity because it seems to be a little less risky. So, so the, you know, I think there are a couple of different points here, but I would say the last thing I would say is that the traditional venture capital fundraising calendar is kind of thrown out of the window for 2020. Uh, by that, I meant traditionally speaking right now is pretty much dead. People hold off until, you know, after Labor Day. So there's like two prime, two fundraising cycle. One is January 2nd to 4th of July. And again, it's a very US centric view. The other is Labor Day through Thanksgiving. But because of COVID, there is a little bit of pent up demand, so to speak, and people not talking to investors. So right now, you know, July was really busy, I know, for a lot of people. And I, I expect actually fall to be even busier. And I have no idea what January 2021 is going to look like. I actually think that is potentially not a great time to come out because everybody kind of planned to wait till January of 2021 to talk to investors. Um, so those are our observations. Great. Thank you, Marathi. Wow. Um, Lee, you want to Yeah, no, I, I think that's so interesting. And, and I was going to wonder, like on the VC side of things, you could argue that, you know, these days, Tesla, Apple, Microsoft, pretty much any of the NASDAQ, like top 10 stocks have these ridiculous and insane valuations. And, you know, the experts, if they, a lot of the experts are just saying, we can't explain it at all. Mm -hmm. But the ones who are trying to explain are saying, oh, don't worry. It's just a bunch of people, you know, kids on Robin Hood who are <laughs> pushing up stocks because they're bored at home day trading. And now the smart money managers have to follow because they can't underperform the mm -hmm. index, blah, blah, blah. So there's all these explanations for the public markets, but I was wondering why in the world is the private like market also kind of a little bubbly right now, or at least, or at least not oh, nearly as depressed you know, as you expect. The, on that note, one last dynamic I would add is um, if you're a 500 million or billion dollar Series A fund, um, you are typically deploying these. By the way, these this day and age, which is different than the when you're working on, you know, first start working yeah. on Renhop, right? Like. Right, right, right. You know, 10 years ago, Series A is called $3 million round. That's what we do now. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> C, seed is the new Series A. And these days, Series A is a $10 million or even $15, $20 million pile on. Everything is working, you know, put uh, kind of fuel on, on, on fire type round. So with that context, you know, now suddenly you can't meet founders in person. It becomes much harder to deploy and build conviction and say, hey, I'm going to write a $10 million check. Um, as a result, we're seeing a little bit of the Series A folks coming down to do a little bit more of a seed, uh, more so in the West Coast than in New York, uh, to be honest. And, as, and, and, you know, two reasons. One, it's a little easier to play smaller bets when you can't meet people in person and you want to tell your LPs that you're like doing stuff. Two is um, it's also historically a, a good training ground for junior partners uh, in that you know, with internal politics and dynamics of getting deals through partnership, as again, in this environment, I think that's exacerbated a little bit. Um, that's cool. And, and so you're, you're, you're seeing them come earlier in the market and making more smaller bets now. Yeah, but like, you know, I think now. that's, as you, as you probably have seen, every, mm -hmm. you know, Series A doing C deals comes in and out of favor, right? Because if you right. do the math on the business model, you can't deploy... $2 million checks as a, as a partner at a seven person right, right. partnership for a $800 million fund. It's just the mass. Right. You, can, you can't sit on 200 boards. Right. Right? And, and yeah, so, you can't be a partner. Yeah. So honestly, I think this is um, the, the challenge with that though, is for certain going back to the flight to quality thing for companies that are perceived as quality, which by the way, has a more of a traditional Silicon Valley bias, right? Like, Oh, two people coming out of Facebook, building something, blah, blah, blah. And that can get bit up to like, you know, mid double digit pre with no product. So like 
people who have fly to quality, I think to, especially to teams that look more in as opposed to out of the traditional uh, stereotypes right. that have connected right. tissues to the investor base. And those especially get bid up. And then when series A firms come in to do something like that, then they're less price sensitive because we care about owning right. of right. it. We're an $80 million fund. And you know that is very important to turn a fund three to five times. But if you're an $800 million fund, you're just buying an option because you just want to make sure if the thing works, you can basically be the lead for a series A. But then you don't really care if it doesn't work because it's a hundred million dollar fund. I, I know that's well. diverging, but yeah. No, so, so that is that is the V. If I'm understanding correctly, that is actually how VCs are pivoting. So instead of yeah, instead of finding ten really like heavily heavy diligence portfolio companies, since they can't do the same diligence, instead of having ten big positions. They're buying kind of a hundred out of money call options and hoping that you know one of these guys or some of these guys are going to come through, and well, that's actually the way of pivoting. I mean, I, I want to caution. I, I mean, I want to caveat that I, you know not every single Series A firm is doing that, right? right. Um, some right. people are you know sticking to their knittings more. Again, like if you think about on the volume basis, most of the seed rounds are still getting done by institutional C firms like us, right? So maybe it's one in 10 that gets into that kind of situation. Um, right. But I do think on the margin, it, it, it is hard, right? Like you're a partner, you're trying to build conviction on a team to put $10 million to work. And that's just scary when you can't spend time with it, a different person. Uh, yeah, is there, yeah, is there any reputational risk where, you know, if you have time to sit on boards of just say 10 companies and now you just, you're not even on the board anymore. You're just kind of joining big rounds of or course. joining states. I mean, now yeah. it's like, uh oh, our, our hit rate's not, our batting average is worse than it used to be, right? But people yeah, must understand. It, it's less about the batting average, is more about, you know, I think you're right, like the reputational risk, right? That's why savvy right. founders know that they might not, like, they know they have to know what are the trade offs of even taking a token check into the syndicate of a series A firm. Because what if they don't lead your series right. A? That's even right, right. worse than the signal issue. Um, right, 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 right. Right. So, so right, well, right. thank you much, Melody. I think, I think that's great touching in the, from the VC perspective. So, as we're talking about yeah. everything, Lee, I'm really curious about like maybe we can hear from your side. Yeah. Like, I mean, up, I, I really like how Melody described this category one, two, three type company. And I'll give you guys, so I, I can talk a whole lot about Renhop later, but I want to give one kind of cool example. Um, disclaimer, I'm talking my book a tiny bit because I think people know I was I was one of the early investors in Zenefits and then later on Rippling, which mm. was Parker Conrad's startup. Long story there, but I mean, mm. they've always been about, you know, Parker is the master at really seeing where the opportunity is and adapting to it. Uh, just to take you guys back a little bit, Zenefits was meant to be uh, an HR startup that helps HR find the right way to manage their employees and find them benefits. But they started mm. right when Obamacare was coming out. Mm. And they knew that there was going to be this huge demand where people needed to know all the options on these health marketplaces, healthcare marketplaces, and also the Obamacare exchange, whatever. And so Zenefits basically build themselves as we aggregate all the health insurance plans you could possibly buy. And mm. that's why you should use benefits. And so they had this like monstrous growth, but then long story short, they probably grew too fast and did some weird mm -hmm. things. And eventually he had to leave the company and now comes Rippling, which is effectively kind of a HR software. A big competitor of theirs would be Gusto and, mm -hmm. and many other folks. So anyway, you would expect a company like Rippling to be absolutely category one. Right. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of, in, in other words, they're in the worst situation when COVID hits because yeah. if all of their growth depends on tons of startups continuing to hire and hire and hire with all their VC money and even like medium size or bigger companies also needing kind of HR to manage everything, you would think, wow, their business is entirely impacted by COVID. And so one of the first kind of weeks into the, into the whole pandemic, I started thinking, uh oh, I wonder, wonder how this guy's gonna pivot because I know this guy's really good at pivoting and finding the right opportunity. So, so I go on to Rippling and check it out, and I was really, really pleasantly surprised. 
So what did I see? I saw that, you know, this huge stink about the uh, PPP, mm. right? This, mm. The whole bailout PPP paycheck protection program loan thing that was like really weird and hard to navigate and nobody had any idea what was mm. going on. Even Congress was like fighting amongst themselves and, mm -hmm. you know, SBA, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it was a mess. And the first thing you see on Rippling is we figured out exactly how to navigate PPP. We will help you and your company and all your independent contractors just file a PPP application and we'll hold your hand all the way through it and you should use us. And I'm sure like even if they had no idea what was going on and they're just as clueless as everyone else, at least they were really positioning themselves well. And, you know, as I did more searches, like they were right on top of being one of the first content providers. Um, they were hitting the top of my Google searches on guidance for PPP. So, I mean, that's just an example of seeing the opportunities and just not letting the market get to you and finding a very cool pivot. So who knows if it worked or not, but and I, I know they raised a huge round just recently. Uh, I think it was just announced last month. Mm. And so whatever they did was at least impressive enough for investors. They probably got them a whole lot of new users who applied for PPP through them, for example, that might not have not considered them otherwise. Uh, the other very notable pivot was Cabbage. Cabbage was, I think, some mm -hmm. just a random like loan provider, but they also partnered mm -hmm. with Stripe and Atlas and so many other companies to also become one of these like leading navigate the stimulus, navigate all the various bailout packages that you're qualified for. And I think they just announced they're getting acquired by American Express. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. well, you know, the, these are the kind of pivots we want to see from, I guess, very dynamic founding teams who know how to how to really adapt. Very impressive. Great. I, I think the the cabbage definitely is a good example. I think that a lot of founders we've been collaborating, they they also using that to apply to PPP. That just like out of nowhere, certainly is a startup helping you in the PPP application, and they're great to yeah. hear from Sunnyfit. So Lee, to follow up on that, I think I think more still like quite interesting in the Ren Hub. I mean that you yeah. basically start Ren Hub in the middle of a 2008 financial crisis, right? And then uh, you kind of survive through, I think now another kind of economic down run in the past few months, both actually touching and having impact in real estate and Ren Hub yeah. also in the real estate. So yeah, so maybe there's a secret sauce Oh, that's <laughs> you to share. Like, I think founders and also people who are interested in the startup definitely looking for all kind of like some suggestion. Sure, sure, you, sure. You think you probably. I mean, the the first caveat is it's not over yet. So who knows? Mm -hmm. So everything I say, take with a grain of salt, because definitely um, we're not completely done with this entire pandemic. Obviously, mm -hmm. and it is very tragic. And mm -hmm. but. You know, I can speak to my experiences and how we were able to navigate through. Um, I'll say one thing, my co-founder Lawrence, our personalities kind of work well together because he is kind of the perma pessimist and he is always the one that's super worried. And so by default, I, I kind of need to be the one that's more optimistic at all times. And I remember at the beginning, like this is kind of, middle to end of March of this year, right when Cuomo ordered the entire shelter in place thing. Mm -hmm. He just started freaking out and saying, oh man, it's all over, man. We got to start planning for like 95% revenue drops all the way throughout for the next like 18 months and model that out to see what we need to do to survive. And I was like, I don't know, man, I think 95% haircuts pretty big, pretty bad. Um, here's what actually happened. And it's kind of amazing. There's this one book called, I think, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And ben Horowitz, yep. I only got through the first few chapters, so I don't actually know if the later part of the book was any good, but one of the earlier, early chapters is called the Withio chapter, and I love that so much because when you do a startup, there are so many moments where you just say, we are fucked, and it's all over, and that's what Withio stands for. We're done <laughs> all over. And the truth is most of the time, no matter how bad things feel like they're getting, it's not actually that bad. It only feels bad because you don't really have a manager to tell you it's okay. And you've got lots of employees to answer to, and you have to assure them it's okay when you don't know it is. But at the end of the day, it's never that bad. So what do we do? We, 
I did, you know, I did do some busting out the spreadsheets and figured out that, okay, things could get pretty bad, but we can survive a pretty long time. We are, we are very lucky in that we're kind of, I would say, a bootstrapped company. We did raise money along the way, but we always got profitable pretty early on. So we weren't on this VC treadmill. Mm -hmm. But specifically for real estate, I can say a few things we do. Um, one of the first things we did was we noted, okay, is this affecting the whole industry and all mm -hmm. our competitors? And clearly, mm -hmm. yes. You know, our biggest competitor in New York by far is Zillow owned Street Easy. Mm -hmm. And they just immediately cut all of their prices by half. Mm -hmm. Like they just told everyone, all right, we're cutting by 50%. And then even then they lost a whole lot of their customers and listings, but you know, at the, at best their revenues dropped 50%. So we kind of had a slightly different approach where we were saying, you know, if you guys are willing to keep your plans and not cancel your plans, uh, we have say, you know, thousands over a thousand accounts of paid accounts where people are paying us a certain amount of month. You're normally either a landlord or a real estate agent. Mm -hmm. And, we told them as long as you stay loyal, normally you have to use up all of your advertising credits at the end of each month or so. But we kind of took the audible approach where mm -hmm. we're letting you roll over a bunch of credits indefinitely throughout this pandemic. And so one of the things I will say is, you know, I don't actually know yet if this was the perfect play because now that we're kind of coming out and reopening, uh, we have to have this second awkward conversation of, all right, we were generous letting you roll over all of these advertising credits on your account. But we also know we can't let them stockpile and hoard forever. So now it's a matter of um, when you take drastic action to, I guess, uh, during, during a bit of a disaster, like you still have to think about how you actually get out of it. Um, but I will say, all, all told, I am amazed how quickly kind of things got a lot better. Um, just to give actual numbers, I mean, off the record, right? Uh, yeah. April, April was a pretty big hit. We were down about 35% year over year. And then May was a little bit better. You know, we were still down a good 25%. So April and May were kind of the real gut punches. Mm -hmm. But by June, July, we're already at break even. And now August, it looks like we're profitable again. So that that's one thing that I really... I'm amazed. If you had told me that all of real estate, all real estate showings would not be allowed for three months, and everyone would be leaving New York City in droves to look for like suburbs and other places to hang out, I wouldn't have expected to come back quite yet. Again, we're not we're not through it yet. So, mm -hmm. but not that way. I think the worst is over. Mm -hmm. um, as for the big pivot, if there's anything we did that's considered a big pivot, uh, we noticed right away most of our clients used to be professional real estate agents or just professional landlords that mm -hmm. own a lot of buildings and units. Think TF Cornerstone. You know, they own Two Gold or the guys who run 200 Water, big high rises. But we saw a ton of what we're calling the for rent by owner mm -hmm. or the uh, non-professional landlords. And a lot of them included people who are locked in a lease and actually need to break their leases. So if you had a lease but you decide you're gonna to leave town because your company's gonna let you work remotely and you're gonna live somewhere else, then you actually need to find a subletter ASAP. Because when you've already found a place to go and you've left New York and yet your lease renew is renewed until next April or May, now you've become a landlord of one unit that you need to rent out. So we actually rolled out a whole new product focusing on this new sector. And that's actually been the largest growing part of our business uh, in, in a huge way. It used to account for about less than 2% of our business. And now it looks like it's double digits of our business revenue wise and with, with a lot more room to grow. Uh, it's also very useful because this kind of inventory are things that are exclusive or semi-exclusive. Like other sites tend to have, every site has the listings from TF Cornerstone, for example, with like huge landlords. Mm -hmm. But very few sites will have the one guy who's trying to sell at his place. He's probably going to list it on one or two sites and maybe not all of our competitors. So we actually find this to be a pretty good growth sector. It's not quite a cabbage level pivot, but but it's a, but it's a nice way to, uh, I think, look at the opportunities and lean into what's working. Great, I, I really appreciate that. And it's really interesting to learn that um, your personal insight and your hope that those two down times and the, those detail work. And I'm really appreciate you share that actually in the traction, how much you guys down and this honest and transparency there. 
So since we're talking, I want to drill a little further on that. Um, so Melody and Lee, from both of you, you guys, investor, also join the startup or working with startup. What's the biggest difference in your understanding and preservation that comparing to between the two economic the downtime in the mm -hmm. 08 and the, the current one? I mean, now we are going back, right? Mm -hmm. um, because I think they will provide a good framework and a macro view for an, on the audience in front of the screen right now to think about the difference and leading to the, the, the future, right? It's going to be repeat the same pattern, a lot of startup going booming up, um, or it just be another different kind of scenario moving forward. Yeah, I, um, you know, 2008, um, so I, I did, a, I, I, I had a venture job. So I was a junior VC about 10 years ago, 11 years ago in New York. Um, I, that was 2009 to 2011. So this is right after kind of the, the, the Lehman, Bear Stearns, it's very Wall Street centric, right? Of 2008, obviously the mortgage crisis accelerated, you know, basically put the entire country into a, into a, into a bad place and impact a lot of everyday American. Um, back then, like, I, I think one thing that I remembered really vividly and Lee, you probably remember this too. Sequoia put out a deck with like, oh, yeah. Rip. as uh, RIP good times and Rip good times. it's really bad PowerPoint art, but I encourage people to check it out because it's like, I just remember that deck really, really vividly as a junior VC. Um, you know, I, I see like now, look, the stock market is really weird. Um, the government's printing more money than it used to, like back then. The rescue package for everyday Americans is very different. So like the macroeconomic measures are very different in terms of how the government dealing with this round versus last round. I would say, I think the other really big difference is the fact that we just put the entire economy on pause. And that is, that is very unique. Um, unfortunately, I think the impact to like the everyday Americans is going to be harder and more broadly felt. Um, and the third thing that's different is like, you know, this is actually very technology related, which is we have no idea how we're going to work post COVID. It's not just like, oh, that's just there. I think people for two months, people are talking about like, oh, once this is done, go back to like normal. There is no, I don't think there is the old normal and nobody knows what and when the new normal looks like. And I think that in, that impacts not just work, that impacts healthcare, that impacts education, probably e-commerce. Uh, so I actually think this is a very interesting time because it presents a lot of opportunities for innovation. But you know, going back to the kind of the downturn versus downturn comparison, honestly, I think for companies that were hit or they perceived to be hit very hard, like you know, real estate, right? Back in March, those are the companies that took the drastic measure and cut to the bones and now they're sounding like oh this is actually not as bad we're surviving we have runway and i actually think that's going to be a blessing in disguise because then they have more opportunities to maneuver from here on um i worry a little bit about you know i think i don't think anybody knows like what the how bad the bad looks like i don't think we're in it yet um and, and i just think that this this is this is more of a behavioral change as opposed to just pure recession. So this is kind of the biggest difference between this time and 2008. Um, but with that, you know, as an early stage investor, I also, I also think it's a really fortunate time to be able to deploy capital right now, because I do think that founders that are starting companies now really want to start companies because it's not that easy. This is not like, oh, let's just quit my Facebook job and go start a company because it's fashionable. Um, and I do think there's a lot of influx. And the other phrase we use internally is pulling the future forward. There are certain categories that I think that with this environment, you, you are forced to like permanently pull the future behavior that you're going to do anyway, maybe five to seven years out forward. And I think E-commerce is a certain category is probably a good example of that. Um, so yeah, so I, I think it's very interesting in that regard. But I, I honestly, I think from like a pure economic downturn impact, like GDP, you know, th I think this is worse. This is this is like this is a this is a this is I think two thousand eight uh, is probably not 
not a good comparison to this, unfortunately. Thank yeah, you. The, the the markets thought? are very, I mean, mar markets are definitely very strange, but Weird. I think one huge difference, uh, Melody touched on this earlier, as far as funding rounds go, in 2008 versus 2020, you kind of add a zero to each round. Like, remember Y Combinator, when I did it, you got $15,000 and gave up 6% of your company. And at the time, I still stand by this. It's the best deal we ever took because we definitely would not have succeeded without Y Combinator's help back then. Uh, and now even YC gives, you know, yeah. at a zero to that. I think they give about 150 or 120,000. So it's something six figure. They keep changing it a little bit, but it is six figures. And yeah, I think a Series A back in the day, you know, I think, I think you'd have like $1 million Series A's back then or at least one or two. And that's like, you know, a modest seed round these days. It's like a, a nice, healthy seed round. It's called pre seed, so, Lee. A million dollar round is yeah. called pre seed now. I know it's weird. <laughs> so, so here, what do, I don't know if there's any huge takeaway other than in 2008 when you did a startup and things were going kind of not that well, you know, not a big deal. You you barely have enough money to like keep on feeding yourself ramen, right? That's that's how the whole ramen profitable mm -hmm. term even came along, which was okay if you've at least broken even enough to li to pay your rent and live very frugally then you never die. And so I think a lot of startups used to just, a lot more startups used to bootstrap mm -hmm. because valuations are so low that why not bootstrap a lot longer rather than give up, you know, 20% of your company for a hundred thousand dollars or whatever, whatever it is. And nowadays though, with funding so easy to come by in the last five years or so, or at least relatively easy, mm -hmm. I know funding yeah. is still yeah. hard. Yeah. But still, if, if you've already, taken on millions of dollars and, and maybe even some board seats before really getting kind of product market fit or before getting a lot of traction with a lot of questions unanswered. I'm kind of curious what actually happens when you're pre-revenue, definitely pre-break-even at least, and yet you've got a lot of burn because you've got mm -hmm. all these employees mm -hmm. who have been, you've been hiring and building this product. It's a lot harder now to just get ramen profitable with a team of 20. Because I guarantee you, like even if you and your co-founders are okay eating pizza and ramen, I guarantee you yeah. like, all the engineers you hired will not if they can just get a job somewhere else. And so, yeah, I wonder what that difference will look like for startups that are kind of in the five to 50 employees, but still not yet in a sustainable break-even state where they are gonna have to hit certain metrics to be able to get their next round of funding. And if it's clear you can't get to those metrics as originally planned, you have to have these tough conversations with not just your current investors, but whoever you think might help you in a follow-on round or start discussing a down round or a sideways round of some sort or bridge. I don't, I don't I, maybe Melody can speak more to that, but to me, that's one of the larger differences from the entrepreneur community of you can't just go frugal the way you used to be able to, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, these days, by the time they come to us, people come to us, you know, most of the time I say we're still just looking at founding team. Like, they, people don't really bring on employees until after, like, a real Series A, but that, that's not always the case. Uh, people can, could have, you know, raised a million or even people, some, one time founder told me, oh, we're raising $2 million pre C. I was like, oh, $2 million are called pre Cs now. And then 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 now we're on the raise a four million dollar true seed, and then, um, but I, I think that's that's very interesting because the you know the the fund the funding availability might have diminished founders' discipline to really try to like hone in the unit economics and and not bloat their burn until they absolutely know that where that burn is going to be used for to get that inflection point proof point. Um, the other, uh, the one other thing I, you know, before we leave the, the recession topic, um, I think the challenge for this time around is it's going to zigzag like 2008 is like, Oh, we're down the toilet. And then we're like climbing back up three years later, you know, finally we're close to back to full on full, full, you know, uh, full employment. 
uh, at like three, four percent unemployment rate. This time around, yeah, I read a song where I, I would not claim that I came up with this, but I think the types of founders or teams that are going to succeed are going to be really good at switching between offense and defense and, and on a regular basis, meaning because it is very hard to know, is there going to be a next COVID wave? You know, how do you, how do you actually adjust your, your projections and burn? Because you have no idea how, you know, if you're SaaS, you have no idea how your customers are going to fare. If you're a consumer, you have no idea, like, when is government going to like stop cutting $600 a week check? There's a lot of a lot more uncertainty. One day the restaurant could be open, the next day the restaurant is closed because there's a second wave of COVID. So I think that's just the planning of that just becomes harder. It's no longer just like, oh, you cut. So I think the the offensive defense is that like you want to be able to have the mentality. You, you can't just always be in defense for the next nine months, meaning, oh, you're just going to like cut to the bone because simultaneously you might have a lot more opportunities. Um given the changing in behavior we talked about earlier, given that your other competitors might be more scared and, and, and finding the right opportunities to lean in on things that could pay off. For example, right? Like if CAC is really good right now because their people are retrenching, is that worth being more aggressive? Even though in other aspects, I mean, maybe like Tuesday, you're thinking how to be very defensive and protect your cash balance. Um, I think that's a really hard skill because usually you get into one zone and you're in that zone for a while. Um, but I, I think that's that's going to be probably the biggest challenge for the next 18 months um, for companies that, are, you know, that need to manage runway. I think in 2009, basically when Red Hop was first starting, the recession actually helped us a lot because if we had gone to landlords back then and said, hey, we're creating this new thing, this new cool way to advertise your apartments, they just say get lost. Yeah. And we got lucky because it was really a really terrible recession. And in 2009, they were willing to try anything. They were so desperate. They are like, oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll send you our listing, no problem. And really, if we hadn't gotten that initial, like lots of listings and kind of bootstrapping our marketplace, it would have been impossible to get anywhere. Um, you, you know, it's funny. It's it's very kind of you guys to mention that Red Hub was part of this Harvard Business School case study. But one thing I will mention is, you know, usually it's very cool when a business school writes a case study about your startup because they like writing about good examples to follow or whatever. But this particular case study, every once in a while, they like to throw a curveball and do a case study on what not to do. <laughs> and it's funny because we were kind of an example of what not to do. And I'm serious. Uh, part of the point of the case study was Craigslist, even though it's called Killing Craigslist, Craigslist was kind of the thing to use back then. And it said mm -hmm. that even though Craigslist had whatever, a bad interface, it was like this crappy old software that never improves, and Rentop is this snazzy, cool interface that's a lot better, it, it was still very, very hard to gain traction in those early years against Craigslist because they had the network effect. And, and the whole point of the case is the network effect will protect you and it's almost impossible to crack the chicken and egg problem. And we were so lucky. There's so many other reasons, but one of the big ones was the recession allowed us to get our foot in the door when we normally would not have. And so that's why sometimes recessions are a great time of opportunity if you're starting something new because all of your supply chain or all the people you would partner with are just a whole lot more desperate and looking for new things than they were before. So don't lose hope. Got it. Thank, thanks so much both in the input, in the, the big backdrop. And, and as we're talking about that, you know, the larger picture, kind of want to like follow up further that from both your perspective, you both experience it lead you from two economic downtime, basically you see what's coming afterward. And the uh, mail you've been observing a lot of startup. So to the founders in front of the screen right now, most of the plan, what would be the some concrete suggestions you would like to share in terms of like in the strategic planning moving forward? And I know Melody, you're touching about the fundraising. You would be it would be great if you can touch on it further in terms of like the fundraising strategy and what we see us thinking, rest are thinking moving forward. That could be beneficial for founders in picking out their strategy going forward. Um, Lee, you want to go first? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, stealing I, I, the. I, 
thunder. No, this, is, this is perfect because I can play devil's advocate, which is I actually am very happy with the whole bootstrap lifestyle. And a lot of people say, come on, Red Hop's not really bootstrap. You did like come there or whatever. But whatever. Trust me, most people would still consider us bootstrap, mm -hmm. given the total amount we've ever raised. Because even though the early years are painful, your chances of success are a lot higher when you're not going for a huge home run. And VCs, VCs never want to hear this, by the way. You know, we talked about batting averages earlier, but it's not the right analogy because yeah. no yeah. VC actually cares about their batting average. Yeah. They just want to make sure they don't miss the next Google and Facebook. Yeah. Right? So they just want to make sure they're in the home runs of the center. Mm -hmm. if they're in. But, but still, but still. Um, if it's at all possible in whatever industry you're looking at to find a way to keep your team small and get profitable kind of early on. There's this great essay. Uh, there's a couple of great essays I can send later on, but um, it's a little dated now. But Paul Graham did say, when you do get round and profitable, just be very careful that you're not just a glorified consulting firm. Mm -hmm. like you're, you could easily say you're a bootstrap startup that's profitable, but really you're just a very underpaid consultant. And the way to know is if the work you're doing from client to client is just not at all repeatable and you're just doing fresh new work every time and there's zero chance of turning that into some centralized product that you can repeat for everyone in the future, that that's where it gets a lot harder. And it's hard to know. It's just something to be worried about as you're navigating the consulting versus lifestyle bootstrapping versus bootstrap but ready to grow quick kind of end the spectrum. There is definitely a spectrum between full-on lifestyle business mm -hmm. and then like IPO quality. It's just mm -hmm. there's just there are so few people who talk about it, but there are mm -hmm. quite a few companies that are kind of in our world of hey, life is pretty good. It was mm -hmm. hard in the early years, but now it's a whole lot more chill. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would agree with that. Like a lot of times, founders founders usually like one of their favorite questions is like. What numbers do you need to see to invest? And I say, well, why do you want to raise venture capital? Um, you know, look, I think Ali is right. Like our job is to be like, you know, if you're curious, my partner Rob has written a few blog posts about venture math, meaning like the math on our business, like what's our business model? Actually, for founders who need to talk to VCs, I actually encourage you to understand that because then you know like how we are motivated, what's our role in the ecosystem, how we think about companies. And as a result, this is why, you know, we need to think about like, does this company have some kind of home run potential uh, to use Lee's analogy? So I, I think that, you know, look, I think you just have to be honest as a founder, be like, well, what is the true potential of this business? Because if you own 80% of a business that exits for $100 million, I'd, I'd do that, right? Like, good for you. And and um, you have to think about that versus like, well, once you're taking institutional venture capital, you're on the train. It's kind of hard to get off the train. Taking angel money is a little different because Lee'd be happy to turn his money 10 times, right? Um, and as an institutional VC, we need to be like, okay, how does this get to you know, 500 million to a billion dollar revenue potential. Uh, and so this is how big the market needs to be because yada, yada, yada. Um, so, so that's that. I would say in terms of specifically, if you're on the, if you want to get on the venture capital train, you feel like this is something that you're building has a, has a, as a market potential that needs growth capital, right? Um, to get to fulfill that potential. Then in the context of a pandemic and, 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 and where we are right now, um, I would say the advice is like, you know, related to the three buckets of companies I, I, I described. Um, if you're bucket number one, i.e. severely impacted on the surface, at least, like, just don't wait till slide 15 to explain that. Just hit it straight because that's what everybody's question is going to be. Like, oh, why do I want to invest in a travel startup right now? And why do I want to invest in a restaurant, you know, a B2B SaaS business is selling to restaurants? Like you just have to hit, hit it straight and then like directly, because then you control the narrative and you got to, you got to be able to articulate how you're managing that, given your business model or your sector. 
if you're category number two, which is the, oh, there's a general business slowdown. And then you have to demonstrate the discipline when you're pitching, like how you think about unit economics runway. And like, instead of 24, you know, instead of 18 months runway, which is more typical, you probably want to be like, here's how I get 24 months runway, because you, you want to be able to potentially survive that long to get to the milestone. If you're in B2B, your buyers might be pausing, budget might be cut, then you have you want to talk about how you want to address that. If you're fortunate in the third bucket, then it's actually a slightly different challenge. Your metrics going to be like, oh, here, look at their user growth. And I'm going to be like, well, that's fake. That's called COVID boost. So you need to be able to convince me. I mean, it's real, but it's fake, right? Like I'm going to take it as like, ah, of course you're going to like 10 X because you're in, you know, you're building an app for celebrities to, to meet their fans over the video. Um, and there's no live events. So of course you're getting a boost. So then, then your job is to paint a picture of like, okay, is it either pulling the future forward that these behavioral changes are permanent? Is the CAC dynamic that you're seeing right now going to be sustainable? Are you using that to create some kind of mock market momentum and flywheel that gets you out of that to like go somewhere else? Or is it, you know, uh, a stepping stone to some, you know, some other milestone that, that this momentum might get you to? Because I think then like, I think most VCs are level-headed and that like they know that that is a COVID phenomenon. So like, how do you, how do you uh, nor help people understand the normalization of that post post everything? Um, so I, so that that would be my advice. But I think other than that, you know, investors are still looking for high quality teams tackling high quality ideas uh, in a market that matters. Um, I know that sounds cliche, but I, I think at least for us, we're not be like, we're not opportunistic in the sense of like, oh, let's go invest in like 10 digital health companies. Uh, we do care about and think about what the, 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 you know, what aspects of the future could be pulled forward and what kind of opportunities that might present. Sounds great. Well, thank you for sharing those. I think it's a great uh, idea to break down a startup in three into buckets. I think if I'm doing it from the screen, they probably sell fading in right now and see which bucket I'm belonging to. I think that's the right way and also a nice way to nail down. So Melody, filling out to that fundraising side as well as could be expanding the question to Lee as well. From your perspective and also your involvement in the VC industry, what are some investment trends that have been going on that you think coming out in the past few months and moving forward? And the, and the indirectly to the question that is, what are some startup like opportunities that some prospective founders who are also in front of screen right now, they could get queuing as an industry trend. Um, you know, the obvious ones are like you know, remote work, education, digital health. Um, and, you know, I, I say that like, again, I think most investors are not opportunistic per se, right? Um, if you don't think that the behavioral change is permanent, then it might not be too smart to try to double down those. Honestly, I think that like the most important thing right now for founders, regardless of what sector you're in, um, you want to be able to have a point of view and be able to articulate that with the investors of what you think the post everything behavior patterns are going to be. Are they exactly the same as right now? Are they, exactly the same as February 20, 2020, or there's somewhere in between. Um, you know, other than that, like, I honestly don't feel that like investors are looking for something dramatically different uh, versus six months ago. Um, you know, there are some things, for example, in healthcare, like, you know, there are some things that might be a permanent shift, like the telemedicine uh, legislation has been relaxed a lot. And I think a lot of folks in the industry will say that they don't actually think Congress will revert it back. And that could accelerate uh, different aspects of telemedicine in the permanent way. Um, you know, on e-commerce, e e you can kind of argue that like, oh, once these odd segments of the market get a taste of ordering XYZ um, online or through their app, they probably would not go back. And that's great because that 
those customers would have cost a lot to, to acquire in the first place in the normal circumstance. Um, but I, I think it's, it's less about like, oh, here, go build things in these particular sectors. Because it's like, at the end of the day, we're looking at a team and say, why do you have a unique advantage or inside, you know, for the problem that you're trying to solve? And, and to what extent is that going to put you at a slight advantage versus everybody else? Um, by the way, that's what do you th- so go ahead. What, what do you think VCs do with their pure category one portfolio companies? Like we see SoftBank throwing a whole lot more money on bailing out WeWork, but you know, if you've a lot of money went into companies like WeWork or urban tech or co-living or things yeah, that are clearly yeah. heavily affected. Yeah. Do they just so, say, all right, you're yeah. I mean, nice knowing you guys, or do they or do they protect it? What do they do? Well, so you know, we're a C stage investor, so we don't our business model doesn't even have the ability to like, you know, we we put our check in a C round. I'll tell you what happens with most of our portfolio companies that are in category one. Um, fortunately, most of them have enough runway. So what they did is a drastic um cut. And, and trimming down in March, very like kind of, you know, nimble way to shift their business model to align to the new reality. To the extent is I won't I don't even call it I usually don't call it pivot because I feel like pivot is like oh let's just like change one age to something else. I think this is like here's your mission and this is what you're solving in a space and here are your like human capital and technology and product advantage that you've built and the, like given the circumstance how do you adjust and mm-hmm certain companies in our portfolio, you know, most of them were fortunate enough that they can pause and live till 2021. And even with very aggressive, like 95% down, we have an extreme case where, you know, this business model is like directly impacted and is a 90% down revenue case. And then they assume with zero revenue, they actually have enough, thankfully enough balance sheet to last post everybody coming back. Yeah. And are the VCs okay with that, or is, is there anyone kind of saying, "Hey, you guys, um, you guys didn't really have that much traction. Can you give us oh, back well, the money?" And call uh, well, that that company is a kind of a late stage company. They're actually doing really okay. well right before. That's part of the reason why they got have it, got the it. balance sheet. Um, right. I'll give you another example, actually. Uh, two other examples, since we're talking. One is a, a C stage company. Um, they only raised two, two and a half, something like that. Um, and this company was like, with the board meeting in March, the founder was like doom and gloom. And, you know, we they, literally in a month before we were, they're hitting their best revenue month and then COVID. And so he, you know, again, very drastic, very like conservative assumption, cut, cut the things that he could possibly cut and, you know, capital planning. Um, and, you know, like we, they still have about like, 18 months of runway at that point. And, you know, at the time, like from my point of view, I was like, well, I would love you to, you know, this business was doing really well. You know, I would love you to have a shot at it still um, once this whole thing passed. So I'm a hundred percent supportive of the, of the, of the right. streamed down conservative version of it. Uh, I think they're kind of similar, mm-hmm. fortunately with you, you know, similar to kind of picture to you guys where, he was very conservative and in terms of estimating the impact and then things are kind of back like three months later. Um, and the last example, which is kind of extreme is a little bit of a two-year pivot question. Um, this was a company we were looking at and we had a term she signed to invest before, right? Like first week of March. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can tell you guys what company it is. So this, this is like in the, uh, blue collar, uh, frontline worker training p- space using text. Mm-hmm. When we looked at the company because of the founder's background, they're focusing on hospitality and food services, restaurants. So they were doing right. operational English ESL training for kitchen staff, you know, line cooks. And obviously with, with COVID, yeah. everybody shut down. And they were also yeah. very heavy in New York. What happened then, and this was like, we signed a term sheet, but we're still getting the round syndicated. And so that stretch took a while because then every investor got scared and slash they got distracted. 
But during this time, this is, you know, I would say credit to the founder. They have customers who are asking them like, hey, do you have COVID hygiene training? And oh, they're yeah. like, we don't, but we could because the long-term vision of the company has always been blue collar, uh, frontline worker, text-based training with different content. They were starting with operational English because that's where the expertise is. So I actually thought it was a blessing in disguise because they pulled the product roadmap forward. They built the COVID thing in 10 days. They actually launched a free version of it. Then they got gave it out a bunch for free for SMBs and then it converted that pipeline into a bunch of paid contracts. So suddenly they actually like pull that thing forward because originally in my mind, I was like, okay, before you enter 2021, you need to prove yeah. that you can do something else other than operational English. And you need totally. to be able to sell to someone else other than restaurants. And suddenly this is like happening because of COVID and they were forced to then kind of adjust in such way. Um, so I also think that's an interesting example because it's always aligned with their vision, but given the circumstances, they're forced to like execute on that very quickly. Um, uh, had COVID not happened, would have probably still be targeting restaurants and, 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 right. um, Food, food manufacturing and still doing operational English. Totally. I mean, that reminds me of just really quick stories. I mean, all the real estate sites, including Red Hop, uh, we had always thought maybe like live tours or virtual tours was a pretty important part of yes, the experience. Yes, but yes, as soon yes. as COVID happened, yeah. like everyone pushed that forward. Yeah. Like, yep. Pretty much and every now, site released I mean, live virtual tours. Right. I mean, Facebook, that's actually, including us. yeah, it's very interesting that we have a, we have a, um, real estate marketplace company um it's, it's the exact same thing and then the other thing i was going to mention is like old school businesses this is where opportunities like i'm a vc so i'm more of an internal optimist so i always see opportunities as opposed to challenges you know the opportunities are like now lawyers and title companies they're super old school and mortgage company yeah, yeah. everybody now suddenly knows how to close transactions online because they were yeah. forced to like this is the real estate buying side right? Not the renting side, but these guys would not have done digital closing because you're, they're used to get in the room and have this stack of a paper and everybody sit there for three hours and sign a bunch of documents. And there would be no incentive for them to move. And suddenly now everybody knows how to do that, which is great. Right. It's funny. Yeah. It's funny how you have companies like Twilio who have been around for so long, suddenly seeing this complete skyrocket in their valuations and DocuSign and all that. Right. It's funny. I guess the, uh, yeah. <laughs> for sure, oh. for sure. Great. Lee, do, you, uh, do you have anything additional to add? Yeah, yeah. Just the uh, the other reminder of the entire um, the entire story. First of all, our office mates got super heavily affected. Um, they're kind of our sweet mates at uh, mm. at our place in Madison in New York, and they're they had just raised some huge round like. I think it was a series C or something. Hmm. Um, and their business though is installing geothermal energy HVACs, which requires ah. going to people's houses and drilling and setting up these huge construction sites. And they're not an essential business because you don't actually have hmm. to install this to your house. And nobody wanted construction in their houses near when this whole COVID thing brought out or just lots and lots of workers at your place. So I think unfortunately, yeah, they, they had to lay off the majority of their staff CEO got replaced and all that. So, you know, we, we like to be optimists here, but there are definitely a lot of people impacted heavily and uh, not every story is a happy ending here when you're one of these category one companies. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, man, the, the, I don't recall now. <laughs> it was right in the middle of the talking, but, um, you know, we, we should probably take questions from the audience because we're over time. It'll come to me in a little bit, right? I just I just got the cue from the slides. It'll come to me. Don't worry. No, I don't the jet lag. But yeah, I think that's we do so quick contacts here. We actually send out the questionnaire during the registration. And also there's a like ask a question button. So we actually got a lot of questions frozen. So we kind of congregate and they're aggregating to some similar ones. Um so the ones that are definitely popping out are people wondering about, I think Lee and the Melody, feel free queuing. Um the number one question we got is what which stage is in the best of fundraising at the current time. Which stage? Uh, like yeah. like seed versus yeah, like A or B or something. Stage. 
I mean, that's normally a question I mean, you don't get if, because the purple is asking Yeah, because why does it matter? Right? It's not a yeah. You can't say, oh, I'm suddenly Series C now, so I'm just going to raise a seed. Look, you tell me seeds better, I'm going to raise a seed. I mean, what I would say is um, my comment earlier about flight to quality exacerbates as you go later. Um, and... I think if you want to say relative impact, if you like have a chart and C, A, B, C are like 100% and you like draw like a chart of like, this is a relative strength. Um, I would probably guess that seed is the least impacted. Um, that would be my guess. Late stage growth rounds, meaning like the round before IPO, there was a period in March and April that people weren't doing them because they don't know how to price because they, they, they typically use public comps and public comps are all over the place. Now the public comps are back to very expensive. And I think growth investors are not too sure about how to interpret that. Uh, so there's a little bit of like pause. Series A, you know, for because there are a few deals to be done given the fact that you can't meet in person, the A rounds that are getting done are like teams that have met the firms before or like a very few that have very clear traction that this stuff is working. So I think there's a little bit more like for those types of companies, there's like a heavy bidding war and, and trying to just fight for that. Um, and I think that that goes to series B as well. Um, but it's not like, so that would be my characterization. Um, yeah. And the last thing I'll say is like most seed firms, like our peer firms, most seed investors I talk to I, by this point have gotten used to and accept that we will do business this way virtually for a long time. I don't know if that is 100% true for Series A and later folks, um, be, given the check size that they have to deploy. Sounds good. Um do you get anything? Do you want to like add on that before well, I move to the next question? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think Melody alluded to this earlier too. We don't actually know yet the full effect mm -hmm. of this pandemic quite yet. I, 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 I don't know if we're in the eye of the storm or if this really is, all right, everything is cool and, and we'll just stay here forever or if there might be some other crash coming, right? And we really yeah. don't know yet. It's still too early to say. I think a lot of people do forget 2008 when it, there were telltale signs, so many of them, like even summer 2007, yeah. there were things happening in the real estate world and in the credit world, but people shrugged them off and we recovered immediately and people were like, okay, it's not going to be that bad. Even when Bear went under, there was like, okay, it's just this thing that affects this one irresponsible bank. And everyone was in this collective denial until it really blew up in yeah. September. And then after that, you know, Obama won the election and there was this like very sharp V-shaped recovery until around March 2009. That was kind of what I remember as being yeah, yeah. the absolute bottom. Yeah. From there on, there was still one hiccup along the way. It looked like it was going to be smooth sailing, but I remember summer 2011 was kind of this second credit wave. And then after that, I would say relatively smooth sailing until, until mm -hmm. all the way until like 2014, 15, when you have the China bubble and Shanghai bubble collapsing and then pretty much smooth sailing until quite a while after that. So I don't know. It's so hard to predict right at this moment whether we're going to rally a whole another 10% and everyone's going to feel fine or if there's going to be some huge downturn very soon. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty bearish on in general. I think, I think a lot of people are very scared right now that there's more to come. And when that happens, that's when kind of people who think that this COVID thing didn't impact them as much as it might have, maybe it do, it will impact them later. And that mm -hmm. could drastically just change how everyone feels about all investing and I guess disposable investable cash. So yeah, I, I think seed investing hasn't been affected as much right now. That's totally true. Mm -hmm. uh, it could later on if people who aren't feeling COVID eventually do get affected by this. So thank you. I don't know. Just proceed thank cautiously, I'd say. Thank you. Well we can we can move on to the, the next one. Also we popular among the survey was sent out um what do you think in terms of the future or trajectory of remote first startups in the next five years 
I mean, companies are starting now. They're remote first. They're forced to be remote first, right? Like, I get, you know, one question I get, and this is by the way, uncharted territories, right? Uh, we've built, you know, Lee, you and you and I have been in an environment where we're building culture and companies and teams in person. And then there is this, you know, March, April, the reason why most companies felt productivity has not dropped is because this is a workforce that got to know each other and built credibility, trust, report. Yeah. And then they moved on to Zoom. Um, and that is not going to happen like 12 months from now, right? Because you're onboarding, you're offboarding people. Right now, like companies that we just, we funded in 2020, they're like post seed round, they're raising, you know, they, they raise this and they're hiring people. And founders are asking me, how do I build culture when I have not met them in person and they have not met each other in person? And I think that's a big unknown. Um, so I think this crop of company would be very interesting because they are, they're going to be forced to be remote first. I think that from what I gather, most teams want to be in person some of the time, even after COVID. I have not heard a founder or a team say, oh, we're so happy with this. Nobody actually ever want to come into the office again. And we're just going to like, some people are negotiating in a way their 2020 and 2021 leases because they don't know when they want to go back. But it's a when, not an if question. Um, so I think it's it's going to be great because I think then, you know, you have the, the this crop of company will have the remote working muscle. And then they also, hopefully that provides um, better employee life quality and, and productivity for the ones that think working from home is the productivity boost as opposed to distraction and vice versa. Um, but I, I do believe most companies will go back to office for let's call it half the time um, post everything. Thank you. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I think it's a very uncertain time where this great social experiment of everyone working remotely, I guess has largely succeeded for a lot of companies. And so when it's That's possible, for, I know for now, knock on yeah. wood, but, you know, when it's possible to go back to the offices, will management think, okay, maybe we can do a whole lot more with a whole lot fewer people or just a whole lot fewer expenses at least, you know, if we don't need as much office space and all the people who used to support the need of all that office space. I can't figure out yet if it's easier or harder to measure productivity in an all remote way. I mean, certainly I've seen from my own team, some people, really step up and be very productive in this transition. Um, maybe some people less so. And so, you know, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky when someone who used to be a superstar in an office environment maybe is not able to adjust as well in a remote. I, I've heard this. I've heard other people say middle managers were kind of hurt the most. You know, executives at the top, you're still looking at these high level reports and directly team. If you're rank and file, you can still do your work largely. But when you're main job was coordinating between kind of smaller teams and people above you. I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe organizations can flatten out a little bit better. Maybe not, but just embrace the change. There's going to be a lot of it coming and not everyone is going to come out on top. When all this happens. Got it. Can Thanks for that. Um, I, we do also want to pull in a few, a couple of questions, maybe from the current life audience. So um, there's one good question from John actually. So John asked, um, you discussed the 10 times increase in the investment size. Um, John, wondering if this is a lingering effect from SoftBank throwing billions into the startup market, do you think this trend will be reversed or is going to be a permanent change? Uh, I don't think it's because of SoftBank because that was happening before they showed up to the party. Um, honestly, I think it is, a, it is a product of two things. One, um, so traditional Silicon Valley venture firms growing their font size. With growing font size, they need to write bigger checks. And with bigger checks, they need to have the milestones pushed out more. So Series A used to be the let's go find product market fit round, which is kind of what we do. Now it is, hey, let's pile capital onto things that's working in like 10x the speed of it. Um, 
I know the other thing that is, I think the contributing is um, the institutionalizing of seed investing. Uh, in 2009, you know, that just pick a year, that was the era of micro VC, super angels. There are a few firms that were previous angel investors that raised really modest sized fund ones, like five, $10 million fund ones. And, you know, next we was started in 2010, 2011. And that was kind of the, the beginning of institutional C capital. And with that, you know, and with a series A milestones getting pulled, pushed out because the fund size get bigger, you now have uh, seed investors coming in to play the role that series A used to play. Um, and now, you know, like, not us, but many other seed funds are now over $100 million uh, funds. And they also need to write bigger checks. So you hear larger Silicon Valley seed firms say, oh, we our minimum check size is like 2 million bucks to lead a, you know, a large round. So they're naturally waiting for more traction. So some seed firms don't even back pre-launch or pre-traction companies. Then now you have this new crop called pre-seed. Um, and it's I know it's all very confusing for founders because it changes every two days. Um, but I think it naturally just a, just the accumulation of, of um, asset under management and uh, and fund size. And at the same time, you also have obviously dropping um, costs of building uh, a first iteration of a product to market. Got it. Lee, you got something to add before we wrap up? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it sounds like just, just parting advice and thought. Um, and it's also kind of what I thought about earlier. So that's good. Um, a lot of people, when times get tough, your instinct is to kind of hide, crawl off somewhere and hide and, and really hunker down. But it's almost when things are not going well, it's the most important time to really update your investors on what's going mm -hmm. on or just yes. update your team and your investors and communicate. And what I found was that actually had the effect of cheering me up. You know, when I wrote my updates in the depths of April, May, when things were not going well, I expected to like hear, oh, oh, hang in there, blah, blah, blah. But instead we got immediate feedback like, wow, you're only down, you're only down 30%. That's nothing. Don't worry. You guys are, you guys are handling it so well. And that cheered me up because, you know, your investors are getting updates from other people. You can sometimes learn a whole lot more of the bigger picture and learn that things just aren't as bad as they might seem by communicating more. So don't just crawl off and hide, I guess. I 100% agree. Uh, I'll just quickly add to that. I say you investors can be really helpful and be long-term allies if you build trust. And those are the moments of trust building. Um, and the other thing is that like, I can only be helpful if I know exactly what's going on. So some founders are like worried about putting up a show in board meetings and you know they worry that they might, the investor might think that they don't have it under control or first time founders or whatever. But it is counterproductive in my opinion, because then I can't really put our heads together to try to problem solve. And my incentives align with yours, at least as a seed investor, because we're almost as close to as common equity, not exactly, but we're not gonna be leading your series A. So you don't have to worry about, you know, that aspects of the signaling issue. So I, I really, I really agree with that and over communicate and, and, and because that's where the trust building happens in five years from now, um, you know, those moments become really helpful. Sounds great. Well, thanks so much. I think, um, I think those are all great questions and thank you, Lee and Melody again for answering this question. Um, so due to time limit, and I surely don't want to running over time, we are going to move to the next session, as I mentioned, Percy, and also, um, on the audience on the screen right now, we are having a one minute pitch. It's something we observe is really trendy and they uh, definitely want to give the stage to all those emerging founders who are barely going to any event right now because there's no event going on offline. So I say, hey, we are going to have a lot of traffic and uh, why not You know, um, invite a couple of founders? And we actually got a lot of applications coming up. Give me one minute, I'm pitching their venture ideas. And the Lee and the Melody, um, if you guys have, want to make any comments after the pitch, feel free. So first we're going to have Marco. Hey Marco, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hey, hey everyone. Mark. Yeah, I feel free. Um, we are ready. You got uh, a minute. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and attempt to share my screen here so yep. I can have that visual aid. All right.
Can everyone see it? Earn cash back for something. Oh, cool. Yeah. Here we go. All right. Okay. Marco, your call. Yeah, go ahead. All right, here we go. Let's do one minute. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Marco, co-founder and CEO of Cherry Pick, and we're on a mission to reduce food waste by offering cash back on short-dated groceries. I grew up food insecure, unable to afford lunch at school, so I started selling candy out of my backpack just to be able to eat. I lived a zero-waste household. My mom always told me, you better finish your food, huh? <laughs> so I didn't even know what food waste was until I learned that there's 16 billion pounds of groceries that go to waste. And why? Because shoppers bypass rather than buying the short dated item. They reach for the items in the back because it's the same price anyway. So we built Cherry Pick. It's an app that offers cash back for, to shoppers for buying items within three days of its best buy date. They simply buy these groceries as they normally would, take a few proof of purchase photos in our app, and the cash back is awarded to their account. Think Ibotta for food waste reduction. We recently scored a pilot with Aldi because they see the value in having shoppers mark down groceries on their own. And this way, shoppers save money, grocers recoup sales that they're used to throwing away, and we all do our part in reducing food waste. Time, <laughs> if, I, if I made that. All right, that's kind of cool. I, a quick question though, is it, do you have to be the consumer who knows to download the app to get the rebate, or are you making big deals with the supermarkets and that's mm -hmm. the, always the way you're gonna do it? Uh, well, we're um, creating what we're calling the shelfie right now. Um, we're, we're under a sprint to do that. And so you'll take photos of, we're encouraging like a community. And so people can take photos of things that they notice are cherry pick eligible. So to kind of bring the marketplace in app, because you know, with the way we are right now, we're kind of atypical, you capture the transaction offline. Um, but we want to obviously move to a more digital effort so that they know what's available in store. Got it. I mean, back in the day, I, I used to be all about going to the Chinatown bakeries right before they close, where it's like three buns for a dollar. So uh, uh, I'm aware of the technique for sure. Uh, I, I guess I'm, yeah, it, it's kind of interesting. So I could see quite a bit of value add there. Uh, you always have to wonder, though, is the supermarket? I think the biggest thing for me is how do you get that traction where everyone knows to get this app? Mm hmm. Yeah, well, so we're partnering right now with Aldi in a co-marketing effort. So we've already gotten some marketing appro uh, material approved. Um, we're launching our pilot in Cleveland. No one knows that yet, so keep that under your hat. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we obviously plan to capture the people that are already deal-seeking in nature. I'm mm -hmm. one of those. You know, if I can save 25 cents <laughs> on something that takes me a few clicks, um, those are the people that we'll target. Um, and you know the the beauty of it is that we also en enable something that's super hot right now. Um, food waste is like a trending topic with the pandemic, uh, just being more careful with like our resources. And uh, we're kind of capitalizing on the fact that these also food waste warriors will be early adopters of our app. So um, we obviously want to piggyback off of the traditional um, traffic in store, but then we'll also obviously do a digital effort and generate some word of mouth that comes with the fanatic uh, community that has captured our early users. Cool. Sounds good. Cool. cool. Thank you so much, Marco. Well, I appreciate yeah. the high-end contribution. Um, great to have you tonight. And uh, Yeah, thanks yeah. for having me. Yep. Next, we got another thing. Um, Salah. Salah is actually based in Egypt, right? So you're currently probably, what, 1 a.m.? I'm trying to my screen. Um, I'd like to make sure you are. Sorry. You're going to make it full screen. Yeah. <laughs> right. Can I see you right. now? Yeah. yeah. A minute. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Salahdin uh, from Egypt, founder of uh, Vexels. Vexels is a platform to make the graphic design in Arabic easier for non professional users by providing them with simple Arabic templates. The user can create and edit his designs with no, through drag and drop with no experience in graphic designing. The difference, sorry. The difference between Vexels and other platforms, we are providing Arabic content with local trendy designs depending on MENA region market needs. 
we have more to we have more to thousand and uh, two hundred and forty thousand visits and seven seven thousand registered users. And finally, we uh, on uh, on thirteen of May. Uh, 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 2020, Vexus uh, was on the cover photo of entrepreneur.com. And this is contact information. Thank you. Thanks, Al. The, um, um, have you got any comments on that? What's the pricing model? It's a, a premium, premium. The user can uh, buy unlocks to unlock the premium, user, uh, premium designs. Got it. No, I mean, definitely, definitely. Uh, are you planning on going the bootstrap or funded route for this? Oh, I think well, that that's. For, for now, we we, uh, we are uh, uh, looking for uh, investment to uh, to uh, to improve my, our uh, product, and in, uh, and uh, expanding more and more. And mm -hmm. would it be impossible to continue? Like, is it not possible to do it as bootstrap? Do you see too many need capital mm -hmm. needs coming up? Uh, sorry, I, I can't tell you. Uh, like, is it like? Are you sure you need to fundraise for this? Yes. Because if you're able to do it now without fundraising, I guess we talked about earlier, it is a possible mm -hmm. path. No, we are we are working now with uh, with, uh, with our saving uh, uh, saving self funding on the project. Got it. Does sound very cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I uh, just one one quick feedback. I would say rather spend the last slide talking about the the press i would go into like why why the product is different and better uh, i know you had a pricing comparison you know you have a feature comparison chart but i think that level of substance is more interesting than and than the press mention uh given the constraint of the time yes well, uh but the, 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 the point is and in, uh, in vexels is the, the arabic and local uh designs we are working on MENA region needs. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a different point in uh, our product. Right. Great. Well, good. well thanks so much, Vexo. And thank you. Uh, great to have you. And thank you for queuing from Egypt. Um, so yeah, so well, as we move forward, thanks again, we are running about time. And uh, highly appreciate Lee and uh, Melody for joining us tonight. And a uh, quick shout out for our upcoming event, in two weeks, we are going to have John, who's currently the Chief Product Director Officer in the Privico, and Jennifer, um, the Chief Revenue Officer from Canatex. So both of them will join us talking about the COVID's impact in startup daily operations um, from both the product management perspective and the revenue growth. Again, um, thank you so much for all the people in front of the camera or slash the screen right now, and the Lee and the Melody again. Thank you again for joining us tonight. I know it's 6.30. I hope sure. you guys had a lunch or dinner. Um, based on your time in Taiwan or not. And um, breakfast for Lee. Breakfast time. Yeah, so um, really appreciate the time. And uh, thank you again for all the audience. Um, thank you for supporting and turning. Um, stay tuned with our social media and the newsletter, and we'll see you in about two weeks. Okay? Well, all right. Thanks. And, all right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. All right, bye. Bye-bye.